Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be back talking about Honeycrisp. Um, this is a title I've used before, but I want to emphasize that the rootstock choice has huge economic consequences, especially with Honeycrisp because of the price of the variety, at least in the past the prices we've had. I want to acknowledge a lot of the, all the work that we're doing here is jointly done with Gennaro and Lai Liang, and <clears throat> either one of them could equally give the talk, but they're much more politically correct and never as provocative, so they asked me to give the talk. Let me start with this. <clears throat> Over the last 20 years, the Geneva program has released so many new rootstocks that we now have a whole series of rootstocks with different vigor levels. In addition, New rootstocks have been introduced from other parts of the world, particularly B10. And they give now the opportunity for growers to combine various factors that influence orchard performance with rootstock vigor to give hopefully a combination that will optimize growth and yield. I wanna emphasize that in making the rootstock decision, a grower should consider cyan vigor should also consider soil vigor, should also consider climate vigor, and then pair a rootstock with the right vigor level that will optimize growth and yield. I am working now on an extension project with several of my colleagues to categorize most of the cyan varieties for vigor based on a percentage, based on data we have, categorizing soils, at least in New York, I'm starting just with New York, every soil type in New York will be categorized for vigor level. We've already categorized the climates in New York based upon growing degree days from green tip to, hard, uh, to a leaf fall. And there are differences between say Southern New York in the lower Hudson Valley and in the Northern part of the state. And I'm sure that's the case if we were to expand this to Virginia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Southern Washington, Northern Washington. So all of those factors need to be considered by the grower when choosing the rootstock, especially if there's several rootstocks of different vigor levels to choose from. I hope that ultimately the root to fruit project that we're talking about that we're reporting on today will end up with an online rootstock selection tool in which a grower can type in which cyan he's planting, what soil type he has, where he is located, and whether or not it's a replant disease, uh, soil type. And the system will recommend one or two or three rootstocks that would be optimized for that uh, region. <clears throat> Gennaro's coined the term designer rootstocks for this, and that's uh, a term we continue to use for trying to decide which rootstock to plant. Now, specifically, when you try to choose the right rootstock for Honeycrisp, I think the goal, and this is my own opinion, is to select a rootstock that will fill the space in two or at the most three years, and will give uh, enough vigor based upon the cyan and the uh, soil and the climate that it will have high yields, um, this is key, of bitter pit free fruit. Total yield means nothing. It's the total yield of bitter pit free fruit that will maximize crop value and income. Now the challenge with Honeycrisp is that it is a low vigor cyan and often doesn't fill the allotted space. I have two pictures here below. Uh, the bottom one has a really nice looking trees, but they've not filled the space. The other one has uh, pictures of trees that have filled the space. Not filling allocated space is very costly. <clears throat> Secondly, bitter pit incidence, we know for many trials with rootstocks is greater on more vigorous rootstocks. But we've also learned with work that Gennaro and I have done on rootstock nutrient profiles, that some rootstocks are more efficient at taking up potassium and nitrogen than others. Now for varieties that are small fruited like Gala, extra potassium is great, it improves fruit size. But for Honeycrisp, extra potassium is not good. <clears throat> and so the best rootstocks for Honeycrisp are probably those <clears throat> that have sufficient vigor to fill the space within two years, or the outside three years, but also have relatively low potassium uptake. 
So I'll present here some data from one of our trials at Geneva. It's a 14-year-old trial, and this was data that we collected with Gennaro on bitter pit incidents for these 20 rootstocks. And if you look across this chart, there were big differences in bitter pit incidents between the rootstocks. The one with the lowest bitter pit incidence was B9, had around 3.5% bitter pit. The one with the highest bitter pit incidence was Geneva 210 with around 40% bitter pit incidence. If you study that chart, you would see that both B9 and the very, very dwarfing Geneva rootstock G65, and also surprisingly, but not to us because we figured this already, 214 had the lowest bitter pit incidence. Whereas these other four rootstocks, Geneva 210, M7, Geneva 814, and G118, B118, had the highest bitter pit incidence. Now, other rootstocks like G11, G41, G935, um, all the M9, all had intermediate bitter pit incidence. Not high, but intermediate. What's troubled me about this is that uh, we um, produced this data and shown it, and then there's another big national project that we've organized with Lee Calcet, so we have similar data from many different locations, can be, I think, misinterpreted because you would then say, well, I want the rootstock with the lowest bitter pit incidence. But I think that's only half of the question. I think the question has to be, which rootstock has the highest yield over time of bitter pit free fruit? And that's a more important question than the percentage of bitter pit among rootstocks. This is that same experiment with cumulative yields over 14 years. So this is not just one or two years of data, this is 14 years of data showing the amount of yield total in gray and the bitter pit free yield in blue. So let's look at B9 to start with. It had a relatively decent yield of around 600 total metric tons and relatively little bitter pit. So the bitter pit free yield was relatively high. Other rootstocks that are dwarfing like G65 were just too dwarfing and they had relatively low yield. However, you see that there are many other rootstocks that had higher yield than B9. And I wanna emphasize down here in the footnote that I estimated yields for both B9 and G65 by assuming a spacing of two by 11, a super spindle spacing. Many of the other more traditional Geneva stocks, I assumed a three by 11. And then a few of the more vigorous Geneva stocks I, and M7, I assumed a four by 12 spacing. And for B118, because based on trunk, it was really big, I assumed a six by 14 spacing. So this yield you see is based upon that spacing, even though the block was all planted at a uniform spacing. When you look at total yield, I wanna focus on G210. It had one of the highest yields and its spacing in this particular case was a four by 12. But it had relatively high bitter pit incidence so that the yield of bitter pit free fruit was only medium, not significantly different than B9. Others um, like M7 also had relatively high bitter pit. It had much lower yield than, than G210, even though they're the same size, but bitter pit free yield was, was relatively low. Now other stocks like G11, it had more bitter pit than B9, but since its yield was so much higher, the bitter pit free yield was still significantly higher than B9. The two that had the best yields of bitter pit free yield were G214 and G935. And so this then becomes an economic question. And one of my favorite phrases that I learned from Rod Farrow is when we make a rootstock decision based just on percent bitter pit, are we sometimes leaving money on the table? Well, let me show you that money. This is the calculation of crop value from different rootstocks over 14 years. And it shows that B9 was wildly profitable, almost $900,000 per, this is per hectare, by the way. So it's, it seems like really a lot of money <clears throat> over 14 years. That's great. B118, because it was uh, had high yields, but you had to plant it at lower spacing, was not significantly different. The very dwarfing G65 just never filled the space. Even at two by 11, it could not compete. But other rootstocks, particularly Geneva 214 and Geneva 935 had significantly higher cumulative crop value over 14 years than did B9. And so if you look at this $900,000 versus this $1.3 million per hectare, you know, you're talking about $400,000 difference 
over 14 years. That's a lot of money per year. And so this is a controversial thing that I've thrown out before. It was not well received by IFTA. In fact, I received a lot of criticism for it, but I continue to harp on this. You don't know what you're not making when you don't know what you could have made with a different rootstock by choosing a rootstock. So often the decision is made on percent bitter pit. And so many people plant B9, but are we leaving money on the table by making that decision? Even M9 would have made more money than B9, planted at three by 11 instead of two by 11, just because of the much higher yield over 14 years, even though percent bitter pit was higher. I uh, showed this uh, at the IFTA meeting in 2019 from a different block. This one is also a 10 year old block and it shows total yield in red, a bitter pit free yield in blue. And you can see that some root stocks have a big difference between the red and, and the blue bar. But I highlight first Geneva 41, it's on that side. I highlight B9 and I highlight an M9. And when you just look at the difference in yield between a bitter pit free yield between say 41 and G11 versus B9, that difference in dollars was $247,000 per hectare over 10 years. That's basically about $24,000 per hectare per year. Even with among M9, there's a difference in crop value of $82,000 over 10 years. So this is an economic question. I'm not trying to be argumentative or put down anybody's previous decisions, but I do want us to consider what we're doing when we make the rootstock decision. Now, another controversial topic I wanna to throw out is some rootstocks have naturally higher potassium uptake than others. And maybe this is a topic for the next meeting, but it relates to rootstock because the question is, can we manage rootstocks differently in terms of fertilization to manage their different inherent abilities to take up potassium relative to calcium. We did this survey this past summer of 2020 with 265 Honeycrisp blocks in Western New York, and we ranked them according to potassium to calcium ratio on this figure, and you see a bunch of them were relatively low risk, below a 23 potassium to calcium ratio, somewhere intermediate between 23 and 27, and somewhere much higher than 27, all the way up to around 45 uh, potassium to calcium ratios. And so I've proposed, or Li Liang and I have proposed, that possibly orchards that have these high potassium to calcium ratios should be managed differently. And maybe they're from a rootstock. Maybe it's just the soil. But there are several mitigation strategies that could be done with rootstocks that give relatively high potassium to calcium ratios. There's other orchards that are more moderate in their potassium to calcium ratios. And in those, there's also mitigation strategies that could be done to manage rootstocks differently because of their inherent ability to take up nitrogen or potassium. So I want to end there. I have one more slide, but I first want to acknowledge that this funding came from the Root to Fruit SERI project. I want to thank Mario and Mike Baisdell, both extension agents in New York, who worked a lot on this with us and my postdoc, Luis Gonzalez. Now, I want to throw out, just as I quit talking, these four questions. And I hope maybe others will chime in. You probably know my answers already, so I won't have to respond. Number one, are we leaving money on the table by using low vigor rootstocks, which struggle to fill the space quickly? Number two, can we manage fertilization and fruit nutrition levels of slightly more vigorous rootstocks to give the proper potassium to calcium ratio? Number three, can higher levels of total calcium applied through foliar sprays offset the higher potassium of some rootstocks? Now I wanna stop and just say, I've become concerned in recent years that most of the calcium products that are currently being used are being sold as, uh, you know, the calcium is more available. I don't believe it. I think it's the total pounds of calcium you get on the orchard per year. And when we used to use calcium chloride Dow flakes, we were trying to get between five and 10 pounds of actual calcium on the acre per year, sometimes applying 25 to 30 pounds of calcium chloride Dow flakes. With many of the newer products, the calcium level is so low, we're not getting anywhere near that total calcium through foliar sprays. 
And so can we change the amount of calcium we're putting on to manage some rootstocks that have higher yields, but tend to have higher potassium uptake? And then lastly, are the results we're seeing at Geneva applicable anywhere else? Particularly when you go to an extreme climate like Washington, but even climates more similar to New York, like Michigan or Pennsylvania, where we certainly see greater bitter pit problems in other climates than in New York. And are these rootstock results applicable other places? So with that, I'd like to stop talking and um, I'll still be here to talk and put my two cents into the discussion.